request of one of our team members. This session is going to be about acute inpatient pain management. So first I wanted to talk a little bit about assessing pain in the hospital. So first you wanna start by assessing the classic old carts for pain. And then it's especially important to look at the medication administration record and see any medications the patient's been given um, and kind of what the response was to those. And then it's also really important to remember to physically examine the area of the pain. So you'll want to visually inspect for any swelling, deformities, rashes. You'll want to press on it to look for point tenderness, um, assess any range of motion in the area, see if that affects the pain. Um, and note if the range of motion was limited, if it was limited due to weakness of the area or if it was limited just because it was so painful they couldn't move it anymore. And then also do a neurovascular assessment to make sure that their pulses and reflexes around and distal to the pain are still intact. It's important to note that pain assessments are often affected by bias, both on the part of the physician and the patient, because there are a lot of studies out there that have shown that providers with an implicit, for example, racial bias will provide less pain medication to that group of individuals that they have the bias towards. In addition, there can also be patient biases about perceptions of pain, and um, sometimes uh, patients may perceive pain as a sign of weakness or things like that, and so they might be less likely to bring up their pain to their provider. So. Uh, the WHO has an analgesic ladder um, that's used for pain control. And I wanted to note that this might be, go without saying, but controlling a patient's pain is a part of a comprehensive plan to identify and treat the underlying cause of the pain. For the sake of this presentation, I'm just really going to discuss the treatments of kind of new worsening acute hospital pain. So the WHO analgesic ladder has three basic steps um, that are pretty simple. So step one being start with non-opioid pain control. And then step two um, would be to use opioids um, if there's mod mild or moderate pain. And that's often in conjunction with non-opioids. And then step three would be you can continue to escalate the opioids for moderate to severe pain. And as a general rule, um, you'll want to start with the least invasive route of administration possible. So ideally oral or intranasal or dermal, and then you can move up to IM and rectal options. And then if immediate relief is needed for really significant pain, you also have the options to give medication by IV. You can do patient controlled analgesia where they get the button to control um, the medication delivery or even some epidural regional anesthesia. So first for the non-opioid analgesics, which was step one of the WHO ladder, uh, first one commonly employed is acetaminophen. It can be given oral, IV, or rectal. And the maximum daily dose in an adult is four grams, and that's because um, they can get fatal liver toxicity beyond that dosage. Um, and it's important to kind of exercise, exercise caution over three grams, but four is the absolute maximum daily. And it can be used in patients with liver disease, but just with caution, monitoring those patients and with a maximum daily dosage of two grams. So lowering that daily dose if you're going to use it in liver disease patients. And then doses greater than two grams a day might increase uh, PT in patients who are on warfarin. So if your patient's on both those, just something to keep in mind. And then NSAIDs, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, there's a whole bunch of these. There's several different classes. Um, so these drugs all work by inhibiting cyclooxygenase enzymes, um, thus preventing formation of prostaglandins. And so the side effects that are experienced with NSAIDs are due to decreased synthesis of prostaglandins that are involved in other kind of normal pathways that aren't inflammation related. So our goal is to reduce the inflammation, but there's other unrelated prostaglandins that also get reduced that would be like those that are involved in maintaining renal blood flow, those that are involved in protecting the gastric mucosa, or those that allow for platelet aggregation. So you typically will want to choose a different non-NSAID analgesic if a patient has an elevated creatinine um, or signs of renal dysfunction. And you also want to use caution in patients taking ACE inhibitors or ARBs um, because of the risk of kidney injury. And then you can use NSAIDs along with PPIs or misoprostol, um, which is a prostaglandin analog, and that can be done to reduce the risk of peptic ulcer disease. NSAIDs are contraindicated for pain control and the perioperative use surrounding cabbages because of the risk of cardiac thrombotic effects. Aspirin is also an option for non-opioid analgesic. The maximum daily adult dose is four grams. So dosing very similar to Tylenol. And the adverse effects 
are going to be GI, so like nausea, discomfort, ulcers, and then bleeding because of because it causes irreversible inhibition of platelet thromboxane production, which makes sense since another therapeutic use for aspirin is as an antiplatelet. And that tends to be the more common use of aspirin. It seems to be less commonly used as an analgesic, but it has both of those options. Opioid analgesics produce pain control through stimulation of the mu opioid receptor. And there are a few scenarios when you'll want to do that. For example, if the pain is moderate to severe on presentation, used in addition to non-opioid analgesics when the pain isn't adequately controlled with those, or if the pain is post-op, in that setting, you typically are going to limit the opioid use to seven days or less. And it can be titrated up until sufficient pain control um, is achieved or side effects become intolerable. And this is different from the non-opioids because those have a ceiling for analgesia where if you were to increase the dose, they wouldn't provide any more pain control. They would just create more side effects versus with opioids, you can continue to tolerate them up higher and higher until the side effects become too intolerable. So opioids continue to become stronger and stronger as you increase doses. The side effects of opioids, one of the most dangerous being respiratory depression. Chronic use of opioids may develop tolerance to certain effects. So for example, the respiratory depression, as you increase the dose higher and higher, once the patient gets accustomed to that dose, um, they won't, you won't see any respiratory depression in them anymore. Versus constipation and meiosis, tolerance never develops to those. So as as you increase the opioid dose higher and higher, the constipation will get more and more significant. That's really why it's important to start a good bowel regimen for patients that are on opioids. And then there is a risk of dependence or addiction to opioids, which could be an entire kind of presentation on its own. As an example, a common starting regimen for a short-acting opioid, so like oxycodone, um, in an opioid naive patient would be 5 milligrams for mild pain, 10 milligrams for moderate pain, or 15 milligrams for severe pain every four to six hours. So there's a ton of different you know, regimens that can be used, but that's a pretty common starting regimen. Here is a chart of a bunch of different opioids that can be used. And so the opioid of choice is dependent on a whole bunch of different factors like onset, duration of action desired, the side effect profile that you're okay with, the way um, that it's cleared, et cetera. So for example, morphine is renally cleared. And so if you had a patient with like kidney dysfunction or liver dysfunction, um, some of the other opioids would be better options like fentanyl or hydromorphone or methadone. And so you can use this chart and uh, morphine equivalents are kind of the baseline that you compare other opioids to. And I have them highlighted down here. For acute pain, you can use charts like this to convert between the different opioids or between um, delivery methods. Like if you were using IV, but then switching to PO. Another kind of unique medication is going to be tramadol. And tramadol um, is classified as an opioid because it's a weak mu agonist. It also has serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibition properties, which makes it more useful than other opioids in treating neuropathic pain. Um, and I'm not going to get into neuropathic pain since this presentation is focusing more on, you know, acute hospital pain. But for completeness sake, I'll just mention that some other options for neuropathic pain include duloxetine, betamethaxine, gabapentin, pregabalin. And then for tramadol specifically, some of the adverse effects, there's a risk of seizures at doses greater than 400 milligrams a day. And there's also a risk of serotonin syndrome, um, and especially that's when combined with other serotonergic drugs. So just be sure to check a patient's medication list. Patient-controlled analgesia is a great inpatient method that you can employ in order to help patients have some more control over their pain. Patients get a button that they're able to press to provide IV opioids, and it provides almost instantaneous pain relief when they push that button and the medication is delivered. So this is most often going to be used for post-operative pain, uh, but also, for example, cancer-associated pain. And the PCA pumps have several safety features on them, and so they have a time lock so that you can't, you know, give too many doses back-to-back -back right after one another. There's maximum dose limits, and there's also capnography to monitor the patient's respiratory status, since obviously the respiratory depression is the biggest risk with um, administering the opioids. There are a whole bunch of different regimens that can be used based on, you know, the patient's level of pain, whether or not they've been 
exposed to opioids before, et cetera. But a good starting do- dose in opioid naive patients would be a milligram of morphine um, given in boluses with a lockout of about eight minutes, meaning that um, eight minutes must pass after a dose is given before they can give another one. You wean a patient off a of PCA by first starting the oral opioids. And then once you kind of have them started on that, then you can increase the lockout times and decrease the bolus amounts given. And um, then you kind of do that hybrid for a little while until you're able to take them off the PCA entirely. And the PCA pumps, maybe even kind of contrary to what you would think, they actually end up that the patients use overall less opioids because the pain control is so much more targeted to treat an immediate pain episode. And you really get behind it and uh, tackle that pain right away. And then regional anesthesia, um, which just means local delivery of anesthetic, and it's most commonly going to be used in a perioperative setting. Epidural and spinal blocks are options that will provide pain control bilaterally to a given spinal level and below. So that's often used for like big surgeries or it can be used in labor and delivery pain. And there are also a huge variety of peripheral nerve blocks, which are used um, often on the extremities, and they're used for even more localized pain control. Regional anesthesia can be performed as a single shot, which would be like a one-time blockade, use the needle to place the local anesthesia, and that's it. Or it can be done by placing a catheter that is hooked up to an infusion pump, for example, like a PCA pump, where um, local anesthesia can be delivered over time through that catheter for a more continuous nerve block. Patients can even go home with local anesthetic pumps. So there's really a lot of options for regional anesthesia and overall is a really great tactic because it can help reduce the necessity of using opioids and the volume of opioids used um, for pain control, especially in the perioperative setting. Pain in the ICU, um, I just wanted to mention this because many patients in the ICU won't be able to tell you about the pain that they're experiencing. So it's really important to assess for their pain in other ways so you can be sure to be adequately managing their pain. There's a critical care pain observation tool, CPOT, um, which is a scoring tool that assigns a score suggesting whether or not you should increase that patient's pain regimen. Um, And you can also look for other clues like tachycardia and hypertension can be associated with pain. Um, So you really have to kind of read between the lines with ICU patients, especially non-responsive, you know, patients on the vent, things like that to make sure their pain is adequately controlled wanted to note my resources here and thank you so much for your time.